I saw a month or two ago, in an Italian paper, that the Villa Cascana, in which I once stayed, had been pulled down, and that a manufactory of some sort was in process of erection on its site. There is therefore no longer any reason for refraining from writing of those things which I myself saw, or imagined I saw, in a certain room and on a certain landing of the villa in question, nor from mentioning the circumstances which followed. Which may, or may not, according to the opinion of the reader, throw some light on, or be somehow connected with this experience. The Villa Cascana was in all ways but one a perfectly delightful house. Yet, if it were standing now, nothing in the world, I use the phrase in its literal sense, would induce me to set foot in it again. For I believe it to have been haunted in a very terrible and practical manner. Most ghosts, when all is said and done, do not do much harm. They may perhaps terrify but the person whom they visit usually gets over their visitation. They may, on the other hand, be entirely friendly and beneficent. But the appearances in the Villa Cascana were not beneficent, and had they made their visit in a very slightly different manner, I do not suppose I should have got over it any more than Arthur Inglis did. The house stood on an ilex-clad hill, not far from Sestri di Levante, on the Italian Riviera, looking out over the iridescent blues of that enchanted sea, while behind it rose the pale green chestnut woods that climb up the hillsides till they give place to the pines, that black in contrast with them crown the slopes. All round it the garden in the luxuriance of mid-spring bloomed and was fragrant, and the scent of magnolia and rose, borne on the salt freshness of the winds from the sea, flowed like a stream through the cool vaulted rooms. On the ground floor a broad pillared loggia ran round three sides of the house, the top of which formed a balcony for certain rooms on the first floor. The main staircase Broad and of grey marble steps led up from the hall to the landing outside these rooms, which were three in number, namely two big sitting rooms and a bedroom arranged en suite. The latter was unoccupied, the sitting rooms were in use. From these the main staircase was continued to the second floor, where were situated certain bedrooms, one of which I occupied while from the other side of the first-floor landing some half-dozen steps led to another suite of rooms, where, at the time I am speaking of, Arthur English, the artist, had his bedroom and studio. Thus the landing outside my bedroom at the top of the house commanded both the landing of the first floor and also the steps that led to English's rooms. Jim Stanley and his wife, finally, whose guest I was, occupied rooms in another wing of the house, where also were the servants' quarters. I arrived just in time for lunch, on a brilliant noon of mid-May. The garden was shouting with colour and fragrance, and, not less delightful after my broiling walk up from the marina, should have been the coming from the reverberating heat and blaze of the day into the marble coolness of the villa. Only— the reader has my bare word for this, and nothing more. The moment I set foot in the house I felt that something was wrong. This feeling, I may say, was quite vague, though very strong, and I remember that when I saw letters waiting for me on the table in the hall I felt certain that the explanation was here. I was convinced that there was bad news of some sort for me. Yet, when I opened them, I found no such explanation of my premonition. My correspondence all reeked of prosperity. Yet this clear miscarriage of a presentiment did not dissipate my uneasiness. In that cool, fragrant house there was something wrong. I am at pains to mention this, 
because to the general view it may explain that, though I am as a rule so excellent a sleeper that the extinction of my light on getting into bed is apparently contemporaneous with being called on the following morning, I slept very badly on my first night in the Villa Cascana. It may also explain the fact that, when I did sleep, I dreamt in a very vivid and original manner. Original, that is to say, in the sense that something that, as far as I knew, had never previously entered into my consciousness, usurped it then. But since, in addition to this evil premonition, certain words and events occurring during the rest of the night might have suggested something of what I thought had happened that night, it will be as well to relate them. After lunch, then, I went round the house with Mrs. Stanley, and during our tour she referred, it is true, to the unoccupied bedroom on the first floor, which opened out of the room where we had lunched. "'We left that unoccupied,' she said, "'because Jim and I have a charming bedroom and dressing-room, as you saw in the wing, and if we used it ourselves we should have to turn the dining-room into a dressing-room and have our meals downstairs.' As it is, however, we have our little flat there. Arthur English has his little flat in the other passage. And I remembered, aren't I extraordinary, that you once said that the higher up you were in a house, the better you were pleased. So I put you at the top of the house, instead of giving you that room. It is true that a doubt, vague as my uneasy premonition, crossed my mind at this. I did not see why Mrs. Stanley should have explained all this, if there had not been more to explain. I allow, therefore, that the thought that there was something to explain about the unoccupied bedroom was momentarily present in my mind. The second thing that may have borne in on my dream was this. At dinner the conversation turned for a moment on ghosts. Inglis, with the certainty of conviction, expressed his belief that anybody who could possibly believe in the existence of supernatural phenomena was unworthy of the name of an ass. The subject instantly dropped. As far as I can recollect, nothing else occurred or was said that could bear on what follows. We all went to bed rather early, and personally I yawned my way upstairs, feeling hideously sleepy. My room was rather hot, and I threw all the windows wide, and from without poured in the white light of the moon and the love-song of many nightingales. I undressed quickly and got into bed. But though I had felt so sleepy before, I now felt extremely wide awake. But I was quite content to be awake. I did not toss or turn. I felt perfectly happy listening to the song and seeing the light. Then it is possible I may have gone to sleep, and what follows may have been a dream. I thought, anyhow, that after a time the nightingales ceased singing, and the moon sank. I thought also that if, for some unexplained reason, I was going to lie awake all night, I might as well read. And I remembered that I had left a book, in which I was interested, in the dining-room on the first floor. So I got out of bed, lit a candle, and went downstairs. I went into the room, saw on a side-table the book I had come to look for, and then, simultaneously, saw that the door into the unoccupied bedroom was open. A curious grey light, not of dawn nor of moonshine, came out of it, and I looked in. The bed stood opposite the door, a big four-poster hung with tapestry at the head. Then I saw that the greyish light of the bedroom came from the bed, or rather from what was on the bed, for it was covered with great caterpillars, a foot or more in length, which crawled over it. They were faintly luminous, and it was the light from them that showed me the room. Instead of the sucker feet of ordinary caterpillars, they had rows of pincers like crabs, and they moved by grasping what they lay on with their pincers and then sliding their bodies forward. In colour these dreadful insects were yellowish-grey, and they were covered with irregular lumps and swellings. There must have been hundreds of them, for they formed a sort of writhing, crawling pyramid on the bed. 
Occasionally one fell off onto the floor with a soft, fleshy thud, and though the floor was of hard concrete, it yielded to the pincer feet as if it had been putty. And crawling back, the caterpillar would mount onto the bed again to rejoin its fearful companions. They appeared to have no faces, so to speak, but at one end of them there was a mouth that opened sideways in respiration. To them and the claws that bit into the cement, the wood of the door was child's play. Steel would not keep them out. But with the sweet and noble return of day, the horror vanished. The whisper of wind became benignant again. The nameless fear, whatever it was, was smoothed out and terrified me no longer. Dawn broke, hueless at first, then it grew dove coloured. Then the flaming pageant of light spread over the sky. The admirable rule of the house was that everybody had breakfast where and when he pleased, and in consequence it was not till lunch time that I met any of the other members of our party, since I had breakfast on my balcony, and wrote letters and other things till lunch. In fact, I got down to that meal rather late, after the other three had begun. Between my knife and fork, there was a small pill box of cardboard, and as I sat down, English spoke. Do look at that, he said. Since you're interested in natural history, I found it crawling on my counterpane last night, and I don't know what it is. I think that before I opened the pill box, I expected something of the sort which I found in it. Inside it, anyhow, was a small caterpillar, greyish yellow in colour. With curious bumps and excrescences on its rings, it was extremely active and hurried round the box this way and that. Caught it at the villa? I asked. She looked at me in blank surprise. Why did you say that? she asked. How did you know? Then she told me, in the unoccupied bedroom a year before, there had been a fatal case of cancer. She had, of course, taken the best advice, and had been told that the utmost dictates of prudence would be obeyed so long as she did not put anybody to sleep in that room, which had also been thoroughly disinfected and newly whitewashed and painted. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.